a special washing lotion for the body, a strengthening shampoo for the hair, a face cream against skin impurities. We all have our own personal hygiene habits. The people of the past also tried to carry out regular beauty and hygiene practices. However, many of the remedies used back then only make us shake our heads in bewilderment. We'll share with you some of the strange and unbelievable ways people used to maintain their cleanliness in today's video. Before we get started, be sure to hit that like button and ring the notification bell to stay up to date with our future uploads. Also, stick around until the end to hear about one of the strangest beauty hacks you've ever heard. Tinctures of Lead We've all heard about weird beauty hacks that actually work, but the same cannot be said about many of the facts that we're about to cover, including this one involving lead tinctures. Nowadays, a healthy tan is considered an attractive sign of vitality. A few centuries ago, however, tan skin was considered an unwelcome symbol in aristocratic circles, which was reserved for the lower classes only. Only farmers worked constantly under the burning sun. In order to visually distinguish themselves from the lower social classes, the rich opted for an elegant pallor. However, since sunlight could not always be shielded against, special tools were sometimes required to maintain a pale complexion. From today's perspective, the means that Queen Elizabeth I of England used for this seems particularly grotesque. Accordingly, the monarch swore by a mixture of lead and vinegar to achieve a radiantly white skin and to stand out from the simple peasantry. The queen's pockmarks were also successfully covered in this way. What neither Elizabeth nor any of the other nobles who rubbed such a tincture on their faces suspected is that lead is poisonous and shouldn't be on the skin. Accordingly, numerous cases have been handed down in which people have slowly but surely been carried off by their day-to-day -day beauty routine. This is one of the most obvious cases in which modern science has saved countless lives. Back then, people would use lead for all sorts of things. It was a very common metal that found its way into almost every facet of life. However, we understand these days that lead is no joke and shouldn't be used unless proper care is taken and protective garments are worn. It certainly shouldn't be used in beauty products. Arsenic against pimples Anyone struggling with acne in the 19th century could buy sponges containing arsenic to declare war on their pimples. While the cosmetics industry fortunately steers clear of the toxic substance today, back then it was considered a safe bet to help achieve an even complexion. And indeed, the sponges helped to get rid of skin impurities. But this was also because the arsenic killed the user's blood cells without further ado. The dependency that developed after prolonged use was particularly tricky. If you stopped using the product, the acne came back worse than ever. What followed was a vicious circle in which users slowly but surely poisoned themselves in order to keep their skin clear. Arsenic is a very powerful poison that can have serious health consequences if it enters your body in large amounts. Certain fruits, such as apples or pears, have arsenic in them naturally. However, this is in a very small quantity and is virtually harmless, though rubbing such a chemical on your skin can lead to serious health consequences, not the least of which includes worsening acne that may never go away. Bedpans does the following situation sound familiar? You've just made yourself comfortable in your cozy and warm bed and are all ready to fall into a restful sleep. Then you feel a sudden urge to use the bathroom. In such cases, we have no choice but to get out of bed for better or worse and go to the toilet. What's now almost exclusively used in hospitals was much more popular in the past, bedpans. In those days, people could relieve themselves into the appropriate container and then slide back into the land of dreams. Not particularly appetizing, sometimes the bedpan and its contents were then pushed back under the bed. Those who wanted to get rid of their leftovers from the Middle Ages simply tipped them out of the window. 
At that time, people were simply not aware of the germs and pathogens that were washing out onto the street, not to mention the terrible stench that this practice created around the houses. Hygiene in the Baroque Have you ever wondered why people in the 17th and 18th centuries often wore flashy wigs? Well, why the wrong head of hair became fashionable again in the early Baroque can be explained with one simple word. Syphilis, the chronic infectious disease which is a sexually transmitted disease, is associated with hair loss, among other things. The French ruler, Louis XIV, also struggled with a sparse head of hair and resorted to wigs. As a result, artificial hair pieces soon became a status symbol and an integral part of the aristocratic world of fashion. The following applied. Not every member of society was allowed to decorate his or her head with a wig. In fact, a wig tax was to be introduced in Prussia between 1698 and 1717, with the lower classes strictly forbidden to powder their wigs. The fact that it soon began to itch and stink terribly under the wigs was again due to a fatal miscalculation. People in the Baroque period believed that dangerous pathogens such as the plague were transmitted via bathwater. So it happened that people back then gave up using bathhouses or bathing in any form and preferred to spray themselves with perfume from head to toe. Instead of bathing in a pool of water, fine soap and a simple cloth were used to rub the body clean. But back to the wigs that were so popular at the time, the curly headgear also served as a home for numerous lice. In fact, there's even a case that reports that a mouse had nested in a Baroque wig without the owner knowing. Fleas were also one of the annoying parts of everyday life at that time. Special flea traps were used to channel the tiny insect's thirst for blood. It was a small round object with a finely pierced shell. A blood-soaked cloth was placed inside the flea trap in hopes that it would attract the little crawlies. The corresponding traps were often attached directly to the petticoat. Urine as a universal weapon Imagine if there were a universal remedy that we could not only use to wash clothes, but also to soothe blemishes, inflammation, and burns. You may be shocked to learn that a product like this does exist, and we all have access to it. This remedy was actually used in ancient Rome for many years. In fact, the inhabitants of the Roman Empire considered human urine to be a true miracle cure that could be used for a wide variety of purposes. The people of the Middle Ages also used their own urine to wash their clothes or to disinfect medical instruments. Not exactly appetizing, but true, the ammonia found in urine actually helps remove stubborn stains. In addition, the urine could easily be converted into hard cash. Since tanneries needed the precious liquid to process their leather, the urine was often collected and sold in large quantities to the relevant shops. These days, we all tend to steer clear of urine, especially if it doesn't belong to us. However, back then, urine was used for a variety of reasons. You have to keep in mind that the main reason this was done was because there was no way to synthesize ammonia at this point in history. These days, while urine would still work for these tasks, a much cleaner way to process leather or other materials is simply to use ammonia. No bodily fluids required. Dubious Flooring an ordinary plant, commonly known as rush, has around 300 different subspecies and was commonly used for all sorts of purposes many years ago. Why the perennial grasses appear in today's video becomes clear when we consider that the plant material was often used as flooring in the past, what initially seemed like an environmentally friendly solution for your own four walls was in fact an unhygienic breeding ground for all kinds of crawling creatures. Using this type of grass to insulate your home seemed like a good idea at first, but people quickly learned that it caused pests of all sizes to nest in the floors and walls of their homes, posing a serious risk for health issues and infection. This is mostly because leftover food and feces would accumulate over time, particularly disgusting. Sometimes the corresponding floors were not replaced for years. Even though the grass would have been relatively easy to come by back then, people would place the grass in their homes and leave it there until it was a necessity to replace it. 
You could think of it in a similar way to modern carpets. Most carpets are supposed to be replaced after 5 to 10 years, but some people leave old carpet in their homes for 30 or 40 years. This grass was only meant to last for a handful of months, maybe a year at the most. However, people found a way to work around this and would leave the rush in their home for many years, leading to seriously awful smells and a pest infestation like you've never seen. When the King Has to Resign As is well known, life in olden times was subject to fixed rituals. However, depending on personal status, not every member of society was allowed to take part in each of these special ceremonies. The dukes, barons, and counts who were allowed to stay with the king during his morning ritual could consider themselves particularly lucky in the Baroque era, even if it was nothing more than the ruler's visit to the toilet. The corresponding rites, during which a whole crowd of courtiers gathered around the king who was relieving himself, were an integral part of courtly life. The royal walk to the hamlet was a little more intimate in the Middle Ages. In the British royal houses, it was reserved for the so-called groom of the stool to support the monarch in the toilet. It was the duty of this special courtier to always keep the appropriate toilet chair at hand and to clean the royal rear end after doing the business. Looking back, one might think that the groom of the stool had a very humiliating job. At the time, however, the toilet attendant was one of the king's closest confidants. Some of these chamberlains were therefore able to rise quickly to higher positions. If a member of your family were to be assigned as the king or queen's groom of the stool, it was considered a great honor, and chances are they would soon become one of the most influential people from your family. Just imagine if a position like this were still around these days. Could you imagine having to wipe the rear end of your king, queen, president, or prime minister? What a scary job that might be, depending on who your leader is. Black Smile we all know that regular dental hygiene is important. Brushing our teeth every day not only helps us keep our teeth white and healthy, but also prevents unpleasant odors from the mouth. Long before mint fresh toothpaste was available to everyone, dental hygiene was a little different. Or, in other words, prophylactic dental care was anything but common in the past. Let's look again at the habits of Elizabeth I. The ruler, who lived from 1533 to 1603, not only had a fondness for skin tinctures containing lead, but also for sweets. As a result, the queen's teeth were soon riddled with tooth decay and began to turn black. However, what makes a disgusting picture today represents one's own prosperity back then. This is because only rich people could afford to eat sugar in large quantities. So it was that the ruler's mouth, which was covered with dark stubs, gave rise to a questionable trend. In order to appear as rich as the queen, many women began to intentionally blacken their teeth. A variety of means would have been used to accomplish this, but it's so bizarre to think about how much effort we put into keeping our teeth white these days, when the opposite was true back then. Not only did people not mind if their teeth began to decay, but they would actively seek tooth decay in order to make themselves appear wealthier than they really were. These days, things aren't too much different. Just think about how much time some of us spend getting ready in the mornings. Not only do many of us coat ourselves with a thick layer of makeup, but we may also spend hours picking out the appropriate clothes so that we look our best and don't appear to be members of the lower class. Thankfully, many of these practices are beginning to fade into obscurity, but an overwhelming majority of people still spend more time than they would care to admit getting dressed in the morning so that they can appear to be more than they really are. All right, folks, now it's your turn. What do you think of past hygiene practices? Was there an approach that particularly disgusted you? We're already looking forward to your comments. Please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and click the bell so you never miss a video again. And finally, please take a look at the other interesting posts on our channel, which we've linked for you in the credits. Thank you for your interest. Have a good one, and see you next time.